let's learn some more Delphi basics and in this video we're going to be looking at mathematical functions and procedures that are already built into Delphi so if we want to do some special mathematical operations and we need something a little bit more advanced than just the plus the minus the times and the divide then these are the tools that are going to help you do that now let's first of all think about what we know so far so some of you might remember that Delphi follows what we call as bod maths now in some countries they don't use the word bod maths they use like PEMDAS um, so basically the B and the P are the same thing that means brackets or parentheses so whenever you have brackets or parentheses you must do it in that particular order so you do those things first so we're going to go from top to bottom that's the order you must do things um, then you've got your of and your exponents which will be next and then we have times and divide or multiply and divide for the m and the d now because in our in our previous lesson we learned about div and mod which do pretty much the same thing we can add div and mod to this list now if you just times in and divide in and that then you just go from left to right um, if there are no brackets and then the last one is the a and the s which is addition and subtraction or plus and minus so we know that we've got to follow those particular order whenever we are doing our operation so make sure that you put brackets around things that you want to be done first and then you can do times divide div and mod and then plus and minus and so on so let's talk about converting real numbers into integers now it's very easy to fit an integer into a real without changing it if i put three into a real it just becomes 3.0 the number actually hasn't changed but if I want to put a real number into an integer, that means I have to physically change it. Okay, so there is no float to int function. There's nothing that will convert there, but there are lots of different options and different ways that we can convert a real number into an integer, but it does mean changing the actual value. So let's look at this option. We can round the number. There's a round function. You say round in brackets and you give the value that you want to round as an argument and that will return an integer value. Now those of you who have forgotten how round works, you look at the number after the decimal point. If it's four or less, in this case it is, then it just keeps the front number and gets rid of the decimal value. So it'll be a three. It rounds down in that case. But if we've got a scenario where the value after the decimal is five or more, like in this case, then it rounds up the number to the nearest integer. In this case, it rounds up to a four. So that's how you can use to, or that's a function you can use to change your real number into an integer. Now, what happens if we've got a number and we don't like 3.66 like we have, but we don't want to round it down. We just simply want to just cut off the decimal. I'm not wanting to round it up, I just want to get rid of the decimal value completely. Well, for that we use trunk. And what trunk does is literally just cuts off the end. So in this case, although round of 3.66 was a 4, trunk of this will be a 3. So it cuts off the decimal value. Just take note that if you are using trunk of a negative value, the negative stays attached to the number. So when we cut off the decimal, the answer in this case will be negative 2. So remember that for trunk. So those are round and trunk. Now, what happens if we want to, like we did with trunk, we cut off the decimal. But this time we don't want to cut off the decimal. We do the opposite of that. We want to cut off the front number and we want to keep the decimal. Well, if that's the case, then we are going to use the opposite of trunk, which is frac. In other words, you find the fraction part of the of the number that you're given in brackets. So if I frac 3.66, the answer will be 0 0.666, which as you notice is a real number. So you must remember for frac, the value, the answer that's coming back is obviously going to be a real. So you need to store it in a real variable because the answer is a real value or a decimal value. Just take note that if you are doing the frac of a negative number, that negative also stays attached to the decimal part. So if you frac negative 2.75, the answer will be negative 0.75. So let's take the scenario. We've got a number there. We're going to click on the round button. We get the value from the edit control and put it into a variable. And we're going to use this real answer, which could actually be an integer. It doesn't have to be a real. We can say our answer is equal to round of our input. And it should round the number and display it 
in the show message. It actually doesn't matter if it's a real sheet, it actually it can be an integer, for example. So let's run. So if we take the scenario, we look at the 8. That 8 means that it should round up to 46. 46. And if I made that 8, if I made it 2 point or 0 0.21, that would round to down to 45. So there we go. That's the round function. As I said, it could work with an integer. If we made that integer, that will then work. Let's do the trunk. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use our answer to trunk whatever the input is. Again, this can be a integer value. So we display in the answer. So we take in that 45.989 and it's just going to cut it off. So it's just 45. It doesn't even round up. So that's what trunk does. It just cuts off the end. And you saw the answer there was an integer. So let's do trunk. I'm oh, not trunk, frac, sorry. Frac, in this case, it must be a real answer for the end here because we're dealing with the decimal part. So our answer equals frac of our input. And so we'll take that value and we'll cut off the front end of the number and leave just the decimal. So if we cut off the front end, that means cut off the 45. We left with just the 89. Obviously, it just goes there's an extra null number there at the end because of the decimal value. But if I made it a negative 45, you can see it's a negative. That's just the way that real numbers are stored there. Okay, so there we go. Starting to work. Let's find out some more functions. So let's take this number. We've got a 3, and we want to find 3 to the power of 2 or 3 squared. There is a square function called SQR and we give it a value and it will convert or take that number and times it by itself to square it. So 3 times 3 will be 9 in this case. So you could use the square of 5.5. You could use that. But just remember if you're doing that, that you're dealing with a real number. So the answer would be real in this case. So you can either use it with integers or with reals. But just take note that if you are using reals, you must make sure that you store that answer in a real variable. So when you use reals, use reals for reals. Okay. So there is another option where you can square root a number. So you can go SQRT, that square roots it. Um, so the square root of 49 is, you think it's 7? No, it's 7.0. So this is a case where the answer will always be a real number. So you must remember that for this scenario. The answer is always a real. So those are those functions, SQR and SQR2 square and square root. Another function that you can use is ABS. That means you can get some abs straight away. No, ABS in mathematics means it takes whatever the value is and converts it to a positive number. If it's a positive number already, it stays positive. If it's not, it converts it to a positive. It just removes basically the negative symbol if it's there. So the, a, the absolute value of negative 7 is just 7. And if I say the absolute value of 8.9, obviously there's no negative value there. So the answer in this case will be just 8.9. Again, very similar to the square function, if you use real numbers, you must put your answer into a real value because it's real for real. Okay, so there we go. That's absolute value. Then there's another function called pi. This one's slightly different. It doesn't need any arguments. It doesn't need any values that go in brackets because pi is just a, almost like a constant. It's 3.141, blah, 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 blah. Um, you use it for, particularly when you're doing circle calculations, like area and circumference of a, of a circle. Um, so if you need to use the pi value, you can literally just use it as a variable. You don't need to declare it as a variable. You can use pi just as it is. So there we go. There's our functions that we've learned so far. Now, so let's try it out. Let's do the square of that particular number. So we're going to actually, uh, that must be a float correction. So we're going to square the number. So we're going to say our answer equals to the square of our input. And then we will put that answer in the show message. So let's run it and see. Square that number. And so it'll be 45 times 45, which will be something like that. Um, well, if I make it 3 and I'll square it, it's now 9. There we go. So that one is working. The square root is pretty much the same. We say our answer is equal to the SQRT this time of our input. And then we display the answer. So SQRT is our function. 
So the square root of 45 is 6. If I say the square root of 49, it would say 7. So there we go. Let's try ABS. That's the absolute value. Our answer equals to the ABS of our input. In this case, real for real. Remember, just to take note for the previous one, the square root it must be in a real, like we said. Here we can use reals or integers for ABS, as long as if we're using a argument that is real, we must store it in a real. If you're using an integer, you can use an integer for that. So let's run it. So it will literally just return the number. It doesn't change it, but if I have a negative 45, that just makes it 45.89. And then pi, um, if I have a function, I can just say r input and I can say r answer equals to 2 times pi times r input. Pi will always be a real number because it's a decimal value, so you will store it in a real answer. So that's just using a calculation using pi. So if I, there we go, get some sort of answer. You'll notice I did not declare pi as a variable. You can just use it as it is. Now let's have a look at random numbers. There might be a time when you need to generate a random number in a program, and it's very easy. There are lots of different ways of doing it. So let's take the following scenario. You can just call random semicolon and store that value in a real variable. What that will do is it'll generate a random number from 0 to 1. So any number between 0 and 1, it'll be some sort of decimal number. So 0 0.653 could be a possible number that it comes up. We don't know what it's going to be. It'll be a random number. Now, a lot of the times when you generate a random number, you don't actually want to generate a real number or a decimal number. You want like a, a dice roll or something like that. So therefore, you would want a random integer. To do that, you can, you can do that. So for that, we're going to just go, okay, let's try random and in brackets, you give it an integer value and that will return a random integer value. Now, what does that four mean? That four means that the random numbers range from zero until three. So random four will generate either a naught, a one, a two or a three. So basically it starts at zero and it goes up until one before the argument or the value that you give in brackets for the random function. So remember that. So let's take a scenario. Let's say we've got a dice. You want to roll a dice. Let's go. Think of the numbers on a dice. If you want to generate a, a dice roll in your program, you might think, well, there's six possibilities on the dice, so we go random six. That does seem like it makes sense, but it's not actually correct because if we do random six, it's going to generate naught to five. And that's not the possible numbers on a dice because there's no six and you can't roll a naught. We're not going to take the consideration of if you roll the dice and it falls off the table. So in this case, as you said, it starts at zero and it goes until one before the argument. So this doesn't help me. Now you might think, well, then we'll just make it random seven. No, that's also not good because you, although you go from naught to six, you're still getting the possibility of throwing a zero, which is not ideal. So a better way would just be say, let's keep it random six, but we are going to add one to those values. So in this case, your values go, instead of going from naught to five, it goes from one to six. The naught becomes a one, the two, the one becomes a two and so on. And the five at the end becomes a six. And therefore you've got all your possible numbers. A, bit, a nice way to use this for other scenarios. Let's take a, I've got a little special way of working it out. So we say, random in brackets and you put in the brackets the range of numbers that are available so what are so how many different numbers are uh, random numbers are you generating not what are the what are the values but like what what are the possibilities like there are there are six possible numbers that you can generate um so th that is the number of numbers that you can randomly generate and then you add the starting value so let's try an example. Let's pretend we are trying to generate a random grade at a school. It could be from 8 to 12. Now, 8 to 12, that means there are five possible numbers. 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. That's five possible random numbers. So our range is 5. So random in brackets, 5. But what is the starting value? The starting values, we want the, the first value is an 8. So we will add the 8. So 0 to 4 will be random 5. So it will generate all the numbers from 0 to 4. And then we will add an 8 to those values. So that 0, if it generates a 0, it will then convert that 0 into an 8. And that 4 at the end 
if it generates a 4, it will add 8 to it, which will become a 12. And all this, obviously all the numbers will increase appropriately in between. So that's how you can generate a random number from 8 to 12. Random of all the possible numbers in brackets, the range, and then plus whatever the starting value is. We're just going to talk about procedures quickly, just so you know what a procedure is. A procedure is slightly different to a function. A procedure, basically, you call the procedure's name and you give it arguments. There's nothing that's being returned. It's just, this is the procedure, and in brackets, this is what it needs, and semicolon. So one of the procedures that we're going to learn is INC. Okay, INC takes in an integer value, and what it does is, let's pretend INUM before we call this procedure was a 5. After this procedure, the value in INUM would have changed to a 6. So INC stands for increase. It's the exact same line of code. You could use this line of code, or you could use INUM is equal to INUM plus 1. So take INUM, add 1 onto it, and put that back into INUM. So that's what INC does. It increases INUM by 1. Now you can say increase INUM comma 3. Now what that does, if before this function, or sorry, before this procedure, num if it was a 5, after this procedure it would have executed, it will now be an 8. So basically it's the same as taking num and adding 3 onto it. So that's what increase does. So you can either use it with just the, the variable, and that will increase that variable by 1. It must be a variable. You can't just increase the number 3 because it doesn't know where to store it. So it must be a variable. Or you can say increase a variable, comma, by how much you want to increase it by. Now the other one is DEC. If num was a 5 before we called the DEC procedure, then after it, it'll be a 4. So you guessed it. This is the decrease procedure. So it's the same as saying num is equal to num minus 1. And just like the increase, if you give decrease with a variable and another number, another integer after it, it'll decrease by that integer value. In this case, decreasing by 6 means if we had a 5 before D, this the procedure, it would then be a negative 1 after it because it's num is, is equal to num minus 6. Let's go try out that random quickly. So if I random input, we get a value from a spin edit. And I'm going to say our answer equals to random, whatever that our input is. So it will generate a random number from naught until 1 before the 5. In other words, 1 to 4. So if I click on random, you can see it's a naught. So naught was a possibility. If I click on it again, it's a 4. If I click on it again, you see it's always a different value. And you saw it went from naught and there's a 4 again. If I wanted it to be a random number from 6, from 1 to 6, or 1 until that number, then you can simply just go and add 1 to it. And that'll go from 1 until the actual input that you give. Let's look at increase. Increase, we take a value and we're going to increase our input and then simply display. We can actually make this an int there. Display the input. So. So we can see that 5, if I click increase, it now becomes, we displaying our input, which is now a 6. Okay, if I said comma 5, now we'd increase it by 5. So now it will go up until 10. And the same would happen for decrease. Decrease, we can say DEC, our num, or our input means it'll take whatever is in output and decrease it by one. Was a five, now it's a four. There we go. And the same, if we said comma two, it would decrease it by two. So there we go. There's some mathematical functions and procedures. Please support the channel by subscribing, leave a like, leave a comment. Even if you don't want to turn on notifications, at least subscribe. Remember, Go to our playlist so you can see other topics. And remember, don't do it the long way. Do it the Mr. Long way.